firstly, I express my gratitude to co-organizer uh, Euro Defense Romania, represented by uh, Dr. Liviu Mureșan, our partner from Iran, IPIS, the Institute for Political and International Studies, and uh, uh, represented here by the president of I IPIS, Dr. Mohamed uh, Hossan Sheikh Al Islami, and a special uh, support offered by the Embassy of the Islamic Republic of Iran to Romania, uh, representative here by His Excellency Dr. Sayed Hossein Sadat Meidani. Uh, that's all this uh, effort we try to uh, fulfill this event. Secondly, we have been struggling a lot to organize this conference in a hybrid format, but given the surrounding circumstances and the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, and particularly the situation in Romania, we have faced the impossibility to organize the conference physically. Thus, we decide the best option is to establish a webinar discussion with the, this team, Middle East and North Africa, the, challenge, the changes for a new beginning in order to continue our traditional event. I would like to stress that based on the last two year experiences, we'll reflect on holding our next annual event at the beginning of July, 2022. 22, yeah, exactly. Thirdly, we have work for gathering today with our close friends experts. Thanks again for their endeavor to take part in our project with special support provided by the Austrian Institute for European and Security Policy from Vienna, Austria, the International Institute for Middle East and Balkan Studies from Ljubljana, Slovenia, the Institute of Strategic Study from Islamabad, a special assistance provided by His Excellency Dr. Iqbal Zafar, Ambassador of Pakistan to Romania, and the Chinese think tanks, uh, China Institute of International International Relations and China Institute of International Studies, but also University of Shanghai. I emphasize that we have more than 300, more than 300 attendees around the world, which are politicians, diplomats, scholars, students, and businessmen and business women. The speakers during our <coughs> webinar will address few crucial uh, topics, the elements of novelty in terms of the security <coughs> environment, the political engagement of a great power and regional players, the impact of a large scale crisis in Afghanistan, the economic impacts in the Middle East, from the crisis in Lebanon, the late Prime Minister, the role of Eastern Asia giants in the MENA region, economic resilience under the sanction regime assessing the case of Iran and the not the least, the engagement of European Union with the MENA region. <clears throat> Lastly, uh, I would like to inform you that our uh, next major project is actually a series of events dedicated presenting the book, The Geopolitics of Iran. I will show you here, published by Paul Grave Macmillan. Uh, this is, uh, you can buy it from the website. The book is called Edit by uh, Professor Francisco Leandro from Macau, General Carlos Branco, Portugal, and myself. Among the contributors to the book, we have also participants in our event today as Professor Kehan Barzegar, Professor Davud Kiani, General Carlos Branco, and Professor Ergebed Rosa. Related to the admin standpoints, only a short remarks. We encourage you to pose your question in the Q&A function throughout the webinar being most appreciated ending to the conclusion drawn from this webinar. For any other question not related to the discussion, please use the chat function. Your sound will be muted and your video will remain off during the event related uh, especially to the attendees. We can unmute you and turn, on, turn your video on if you ask purposely to raise question or add remarks during the event. This is for the attendees especially. Please also note that this event will be recorded for a research purposes. Thank you for uh, very much engaging in our webinar. And now I would like to convey uh, the for the next message uh, to introduce the main supporter of our webinar, His Excellency Dr. 
Seyed Hossein Saddam Meydani, ambassador of Iran to Romania, who is also a member of the current Iranian negotiation team regarding the nuclear file, file an outstanding diplomat and expert. Your Excellency, you have the floor. Uh, excellencies, uh, dear audiences, ladies and gentlemen, uh, good morning and good evening. Uh, on behalf of the Embassy of the Islamic Republic of Iran in Romania, it's a great pleasure to welcome you from all over the world to the seventh annual conference of Middle East and North Africa, the changes for a new beginning book in Bucharest. Uh, the organizing committee has gone uh, to great length to plan a memorable event and to ensure the presentations and content meet a high standard with regard to certain important subjects related to the ongoing developments in West Asia. Uh, we were supposed uh, to gather here, there in Bucharest. I'm now in Vienna uh, together, but unfortunately due to the pandemic limitation, we had no other choice but to hold this conference online for the second year. I wish next year we could gather uh, in person and uh, I wish all participants and their families the best. Uh, as it was mentioned, the purpose of this conference uh, from the very first years uh, has been to bring together scholars, academia, politicians, uh, diplomats, and interested organizations to discuss the latest important issues and their connection to uh, Europe. Uh, this year, as uh, our program indicates, the conference includes uh, important discussions uh, on subjects like uh, security architecture, uh, power gains in the region, uh, EU uh, presence in the region, and also uh, the impact of uh, sanctions on this region. Uh, as such, I strongly encourage all participants, uh, with the, whether this is uh, your first time or you have att attended in the past, uh, to make the most of this opportunity and to take the time to connect, uh, collaborate, and communicate with fellow attendees. I hope this conference could contribute to the peace, prosperity of the region uh, through dialogues and understandings among the nations of the region. As well, since we are approaching the uh, 120th anniversary of Iran's and Romanian relation, I hope this conference could uh, better serve the fostering and developing uh, the, the relation between the Iran and Romania as well. Uh, this year, uh, on Iranian side, we have the pleasure and honor uh, to host His Excellency Dr. Mohammad Hassan Sheikh al Islami, uh, the president of IPIS and deputy foreign minister of the Islamic Republic of Iran as the keynote speaker, which we are very delighted. As well, we tried our, our best to have the pleasure to have several Iranian experienced diplomats and professors in order to increase the quality of discussions uh, in the uh, uh, conference. I'm sure uh, their participation uh, together with other esteemed uh, participants would certainly lead to an understanding um, from different views as well as Iranian views uh, towards the selected topics. Uh, in closing, I wish you a productive time here at this conference and look forward uh, to the partnership that results from your networking and discussing. Uh, I would like also to express my gratitude uh, to my good friends, Dr. Mershan, President of Euro Defense Institute, as well as uh, Mr. Flavius Cabamaria, President of uh, Institute for uh, Middle East and North Africa for organizing this excellent conference and looking forward for uh, future cooperation and future events as well. Thank you very much and I wish you a good conference. Thank you so much, Your Excellency. Good morning and uh, I'm very pleased to be here together with so many friends and uh, we will have the chance during one day to discuss a lot of important topics 
with different perspectives and uh, uh, it will be not so easy. Uh, you imagine that we have uh, participants starting from Beijing to Washington and uh, different time zones. And uh, I want to thank on behalf of uh, my colleague Flavio Scava Maria and myself for all the effort the speakers have made to be part of this important event. It's a seventh international conference. This time it's online. And uh, we will be uh, at the end of the day, we will have the chance to have uh, a step forward in uh, better knowledge of the region, of the problematics, uh, trends in the international security environment. So uh, I uh, have to mention from the very beginning that uh, uh, I received a, a message from Vienna that our good friend and colleague, uh, Anis, uh, Professor Anis Bajrektarevich, who is the president of UMS, is in hospital now with COVID. So it's... Uh, uh, it will be uh, for a chance for him to be in good health soon, and uh, we hope to have him uh, back to our uh, future projects. In the same time, uh, I want to inform you that uh, our product, uh, the result of an important cooperation, like it was mentioned, uh, the journal Mena in Focus, uh, which uh, was launched this year, uh, the first issue, and uh, it will be a vehicle for exchange of ideas in, in the uh, period uh, to come. A lot of ideas, people uh, here to our event uh, will be also contributors to the, to the number two and others numbers of our Mena in Focus magazine. Our event was mentioned as an important uh, uh, as important one in the framework of the, uh, of the whole December events around the world uh, on uh, MENA issues. Uh, on the position 17 is mentioned our conference, which is starting this morning. So a lot of institutions uh, and the mass media will uh, have the chance to be uh, with us or to follow by uh, uh, recorded materials or by YouTube uh, what, we, uh, what we will uh, have to discuss. Due to this uh, real marathon of, of, um, uh, of discussions, we have to stick to the time. And I'm uh, very pleased that you have the understanding that uh, in uh, general, uh, we ask you to limit uh, your interventions to about eight minutes and to have the chance then to have a short uh, uh, exchange of uh, ideas or questions at the end of the session. Uh, I uh, will uh, use uh, this uh, uh, task uh, as a moderator uh, in a very democratic way to ask you to, to be very short uh, for the last minute and to concluding remarks and also to introduce an, uh, an instrument of working, which is a bell, which will announce uh, the moment in which uh, it's necessary to prepare yourself to finish the intervention. So with uh, these um, uh, remarks from the big beginning, I, I want to invite now to uh, our colleagues to prepare to have the presentation. First of uh, uh, the keynote speak, uh, speech is uh, it's, uh, the speech of His Excellency Dr. Uh, Muhammad Hassan Shaikh Al Islami, uh, Director General President of, uh, of Institute IPIS and Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs uh, of Islamic Republic of Iran. Uh, Your Excellency, uh, Mr. Islami, you have the floor. You have the floor. Thank you very much. Do you hear me? Yes. Thank you. In the name of God, the compassionate, the merciful, Mr. Chairman, it is a great privilege to participate in this important webinar. 
allow me to take this opportunity to first express my appreciation of this event, my appreciation to the organizers of this event. I hope to have more cooperation between IPIS and the Romanian think tanks in the future, in particular uh, with the two prominent institutions, MEPE and Eurodefense. I would like to express my deepest gratitude for this honor of having prominent scholars from Romania, Iran, and other countries in this conference, especially two Romanian ex-foreign ministers, Professor Melescano and Professor Severin, as well as distinguished president of Middle East Political and Economic Institute, Mr. Flavius Cabamaria, and distinguished president of Eurodefense Romania, Dr. Muresan. I also would like to extend my heartfelt congratulations for Romania's National Day on December 1st to my Romanian friends, Romanian government and people. It is not worthy to remind that 100 years ago on November 1921st, the first book of Saadi's Golestan was translated and published in Romania. The fact that reminds us of a strong historical ties between the two countries. Most notably, Iran and Romania's political relations date back to 120 uh, years ago. And this itself is a field of our interest for shared historical and archive research with all Romanian friends. Distinguished friends, the West Asian region has witnessed significant developments in recent months. The humiliating withdrawal of the United States forces from Afghanistan and the imminent removal of these forces from Iraq and other countries in the region could be the beginning of a positive improvement in the region of West Asia and North Africa. In the centuries, and particularly in recent decades, the presence of foreign forces has had no fruit other than insecurity, colonization, and the spread of poverty and violence in the countries of the region. The imposition of two devastating and fruitless wars in the last two decades was the latest instance of this devastation. And it is hoped that the countries of the region and their intellectuals will have enough insight and prudence to take advantage of this opportunity and establish a different kind of cooperative and empathetic relations. Ladies and gentlemen, the Islamic Republic of Iran, and especially the new administration, has always emphasized the realization of peace through dialogue and negotiation with the region, and hopes that the countries of the region will reach a common belief that security relies on mutual trust and a strengthening good neighborliness relations between the countries in the region. Regionness is the current and real need of our region. Mr. Chairman, West Asia and North Africa region are undergoing crisis caused primarily by the lack of inclusive regional dialogue coupled with short-sighted adventures and a lack of enough attention to multilateralism. Every player in our region should understand that we are neighbors forever and that the only way to secure peace and prosperity is through the recognition of a common destiny. In this regard, one of the most urgent needs of the West Asia region is the immediate cessation of daily attacks on Yemeni children and people, which is now in its sixth year. Yemen has no military solution. And we must all 
do everything we can to stop this bloody war. This could be the prelude to implement a collective security architecture in the region. Dear audience, some urgent challenges in West Asia require immediate and collective action by countries in the region. Dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic and its economic and social consequences, the Afghanistan crisis and its human and security concerns for the whole region, maritime security, as well as, as, well as environmental problems from air pollution and dust crisis to water shortage disaster require the cooperation of all countries in the region. Let me assure you that in the relentless pursuit of dialogue and multilateralism, Iran will always be a steadfast partner. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope this webinar would appropriately highlight the common areas of interest and future prospects of cooperation as well as the possible challenges in order to be addressed mutually. And I would like to express my deepest gratitude for the efforts of over Romanian and Iranian colleagues for holding this joint webinar, especially His Excellency Mr. Salat Mendani and his teams in the Iranian embassy in Bucharest. In concluding my remarks, I wish you a successful program and a fruitful dialogue for both sides. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Your Excellency. And also thank you for mentioning uh, our uh, national day, uh, 1st of December, uh, excellent relations we had uh, in the uh, years uh, and uh, the good cooperation uh, among the EPIS and uh, MEPE and uh, uh, other think tanks from uh, Romania. In the same time, uh, it is uh, good that uh, at this end of the year, we have the chance to look with uh, certain optimism to the developments and dialogues to find out a, a, a sol security solution in this uh, area. So the uh, next speaker, it's uh, uh, Minister uh, Dr. Werner Faslam, former Minister of Defense of Austria, President of uh, Euro Defense Austria, and uh, uh, the host of the international uh, uh, event we had uh, recently, uh, the reunion of uh, uh, all uh, Euro Defense organizations we have in, in Europe. So, thank you very much for uh, accepting the invitation. Uh, Herr Botschafter, Herr Minister, uh, Herr President, uh, uh, you have the floor. Yeah, uh, dear Mr. Flavio Scavamaria, dear Libio Moreshan, Excellencies, and especially also colleagues and friends, especially from Iran, but also from many other countries uh, around the world. Thank you very much for the invitation uh, to this conference, to this webinar. And uh, I will try uh, to be short, but uh, to give more or less an overview uh, uh, on the situation as far as I see it personally now in Western Asia and Northern Africa. With certainty, the leave the US going out uh, has produced a completely new situation. It came late, it came too late, and it brought surprising results. Uh, the vacuum that was left was filled uh, in between pretty short time. And the big surprise was that it uh, was foremost uh, in the first run, not so much other uh, big powers from outside the region, but the two traditional regional powers, Iran and Turkey. Not so much a surprise uh, that 
uh, Iran overtook many tasks because uh, there was quite already quite some influence in the last decade uh, in Iraq, in Syria, in Lebanon, and beyond. Uh, the real surprise brought Turkey because Turkey was more or less standing outside uh, strong activities in the neighborhood in the last decades. And suddenly, within the last one or two years, this changed completely. And if you look, you know, what really happened, this is surprising. Decisive intervention in Libya, decisive position uh, in Syria, occupying more or less 20% of the territory of the Syrian territory, decisive intervention uh, in the Southern uh, Caucasus uh, region, bringing success to Azerbaijan, uh, and, and, and. Even, I mean, their influence in Afghanistan uh, should not be uh, neglected. This certainly was surprising. Uh, and it showed, on the other hand, also what is possible within a very short period. Uh, yeah, if we now look to those two traditional regional powers, Iran and Turkey, I would say, uh, this shows very clearly that both countries do have strong muscles. What do I mean? They do have very strong military capabilities. I mean, the Iranian performance in, uh, with the militias in the different countries uh, is, especially if you co compare it, you know, with the limited uh, economic possibilities, certainly outstanding. And uh, more or less the same, now we could see with the Turkish performance. Uh, this certainly was a surprise that they even beat out the Russians uh, in Libya in the southern uh, Caucasian region in a way that almost was humiliating militarily uh, for the Russian side. When I said, okay, strong muscles, but what is the other side? Both do have, as I see it, weak lungs, which means their economic uh, background is weak, probably is too weak in order uh, to, to dominate uh, such a big region for decades without uh, having improvement on the economic side. And so far, the big challenge uh, for Turkey and for Iran will be to overcome the, this economic uh, sort of weakness. And I very much hope you know that now also the negotiations in Vienna uh, will bring results because uh, what Iran certainly deserves is a normal economic development. Everybody knows how difficult it is and it will be. What I can say from my side, you know, uh, as an immediate observer is that the two first rounds went uh, quite well. So far, there is still hope that, uh, okay, we will have results uh, at least sometime, even if it is very difficult. Now, let me go to the next actor. Uh, it was not a surprise. It was more or less uh, expected. What I mean is the breakdown of Saudi power play uh, within the region. Uh, the Saudi crown prince had very high ambitions, but uh, his troops and the whole Saudi machinery could not uh, could not really fulfill the expectations. And so far, Saudi Arabia was forced now uh, to develop a new strategy within the region. And I think we will be confronted with it. Uh, we are already confronted with it uh, on the one hand uh, in Yemen and uh, on the other hand also in the relationship uh, with Iran uh, in the coming years. A uh, surprise certainly was the performance of Russia. They had surprising wins on the one hand, but only in the field of diplomacy. I mean, their S-400 uh, uh, deals, of course, are certainly a win for Russia. 
And also the situation at the oil market certainly is a win for Russia. But what really was surprising for me, uh, that they had to leave Libya, that the Wagner uh, troops were more or less beaten out. And the same thing in uh, Armenia and Azerbaijan conflict in Nagorno-Karabakh, and this in the immediate neighborhood and under more or less the military protectorate of Russia. This was a surprise. And this also shows, you know, uh, that one should not underestimate uh, developments like the, de uh, the military side, like the development of the drones, but also of different tactics. So now let me say, uh, after this ambiguity of the situation uh, with Russia, who are the winners? What I see, there are two winners. On the one hand, it certainly is China, due to uh, the fact that it could gain influence, uh, especially uh, backed by its economic strength and also its uncomplicated, let me uh, call it this way, uh, way to, to transfer power. The other one certainly is Israel with the so-called Abraham Accord. Uh, they managed together with the Americans, you know, uh, to bring four uh, Arabian powers, uh, the Emirates, uh, but, also, uh, but also Bahrain, Sudan, and especially also uh, Morocco into the boat. And this certainly will change the strategic situation uh, in the coming decades. One should not underestimate it. I usually say do not overestimate, but also not underestimate. Okay, uh, just a few words to North Africa, to Maghreb and toward Africa. Uh, the overall development over there is uh, a further destabilization as far as I see it. Uh, this is the case in Algeria, in Tunisia, Libya, of course, and also even Egypt is not the most solid state uh, of the world. Uh, but what really is endangering and uh, bringing concern is the development around the Horn of Africa. If you look to the situation now, you know, I mean, everybody knows the situation in Eritrea. Now we have this enormous trouble also in, in Ethiopia. We have uh, troubles in Sudan, in South Sudan, and of course also Somalia. So far, there is such a big, uh, a vast region that is tremendously instable. And this certainly uh, is a challenge for everybody because the Horn of Africa is also the link between the Mediterranean and the Indian Ocean, and therefore also the link between Europe and uh, the most important future uh, region. This is the Indo-Pacific region, more or less the center uh, of the future uh, global dynamics. So far, uh, difficult situation. One from my side that I think is very positive, Ursula von der Leyen, uh, Commissioner of European Union, announced yesterday a new program uh, of the so-called Global Gateway, uh, which shall uh, provide around about 300 billion uh, euros in the next years until 2027 for uh, infrastructure projects in Northern Africa and in also in Southeastern Europe, but also in Western, uh, in Western Asia. Of course, uh, between announcement and realization, there is quite some way. We hope, and this is for the first time, that we really can see a change in the European development policy. And this certainly will be necessary. And I hope very much that the whole big region can get profit out of it. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Minister, for uh, your presentation and uh, also uh, using uh, in the best way these uh, minutes allocated for your presentation. Um, a lot of interesting ideas and I am confident that the future uh, speeches will be uh, contributing to uh, 
make a broader picture of this security environment, which is so challenging, as you already mentioned. So I want to invite now uh, uh, Minister, uh, former uh, Minister um, Fyodor Mereshkanu, former Minister of Foreign Affairs of Romania and other responsibilities. So let me invite you, Professor Mereshkanu, to take the floor. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you very much. I'm uh, really very honored to uh, participate to this uh, meeting organized by, uh, by our colleagues. Uh, and I think it's one of the best ideas to continue on, on, our, on our way. When we speak about um, the Middle East and uh, North Africa, uh, we can start, of course, from 2010 where uh, large scale street demonstrations in, uh, in Egypt, Algeria, Yemen, Libya, Jordan, Bahrain, Morocco, Kuwait, and even in, uh, in Iraq. From my point of view, this, the important element was the use of the modern means of communication, such as Facebook of, or, or Twitter, and uh, have made it easier to organize demonstrations uh, and, uh, and others. Now, uh, in political uh, significance of the, what is called the Arab, uh, Arab Springs is to highlight the Arab actors who acted uh, alone and wrote uh, their own history. Unfortunately, the civil wars in, in this region continue to, to develop. I'm speaking about Libya, uh, Syria, and Yemen. They all continue today uh, to generate human casualties uh, and refugees. A crucial aspect often uh, ignored is the influence of global and regional powers from the US and Israel to Russia, Turkey, Saudi Arabia and, and China. Syria is still uh, a conflict zone today. Yemen is uh, confronted, uh, uh, it's a confrontation between Saudi Arabia and Iran. And in Libya also, regional powers are providing military support for different sides in, in this conflict. However, we cannot blame Western states for all the evil in the Middle East, because uh, we also have a lot of Islamists and other groups uh, organizing their activities in, in the region. Now, maybe the current um, developments are basically in two approaches. In North Africa, when we speak about North Africa, the Arab states are mainly interested in developing cooperation with the European Union and the Middle Eastern states are looking for solutions that include the Palestine, Syria, Yemen, or Iran's position in the, in the area. Of course, North African states are interested in having political and especially economic ties with the European Union. Uh, Algeria is one of the main suppliers of natural gas for, uh, for European countries. Morocco has a, an important agreement with the European Union that allows uh, it to be present on EU markets. And it is also an important supplier of phosphates. Tunisia has also economic relations with the EU. Of course, Libya is an important capacity for supplying in the future of the European area, provided that a way can be found to build a functioning political system. The main problem, from my point of view, for North Africa is the problem of, of Polisario Front, which is supported by Algeria, but not accepted by, by Morocco. It is, in fact, one of the problems uh, in this area. Now, as far as the Middle East is concerned, the problems are more complicated. What is new is, uh, in, is the US statement that it's still prepared to deploy, as they called it, 
significant forces and the military option, if necessary, in the Middle East region. All options are possible, especially if diplomacy fails in the talks of Iran's nuclear program, according to Defense uh, Secretary Lloyd Austin in the Manama Dialogue in Bahrain. The Pentagon chief said the US reserves the right to defend itself and not let Iran acquire a nuclear weapon. Although Tehran had always denied that it wants to acquire one. According to, to Austin, the US main, uh, main objective is to strengthen the unrevived alliances in the, in the Middle East while pointing to the presence of tens of thousands uh, more of its troops in the, in the region. After withdrawing troops from Afghanistan, after a 20 years presence, the US is preparing to withdraw its troops from Iraq by the end of this year. Now, Iran's neighbors are increasingly concerned about the concessions that could be made to the Islamic Republic in the upcoming negotiations over its uh, nuclear program. The resumption of talks on the JCPOA agreement, it's an extremely important issue for Middle East countries. Iran had stated on numerous occasions that it has no plans to become a nuclear country, provided that all economic sanctions imposed on it are lifted. The main uh, issue in the Middle East are also the conflicts in Syria, Yemen, and, and Palestine. The involvement of U United States, um, Russia, and Turkey, as well as Iran, also are involved because the geopolitical interests, we have to recognize it, and I want to underline it, relate to oil and gas production by Saudi Arabia, Qatar, Kuwait, and interest in natural gas from the Mediterranean Sea for Syria, Turkey, and Israel. In fact, uh, the Middle East is one of the main areas supplying energy to the United States, China, Japan, the UK, and European countries. As the supply of energy raw materials uh, becomes um, uh, more and more uh, important because the difficulties and prices become higher. And the Middle East, from my point of view, is emerging as one of the most important areas in geopolitical terms. Involving states in the region will require conflict, conflict resolution within the region and less involvement from outside. The made to find solutions may be sought by the Gulf Cooperation Council uh, in Abu Dhabi. The council was originally set uh, as uh, an important uh, scheme for uh, coordinating the security and defense of member states. And in the context of the Iran-Iraq war, but uh, has become a practical tool for cooperation, including a lot of uh, uh, countries in the economic field. Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, Qatar, and Kuwait have announced their intention to create a lot of uh, important uh, instruments. After the Iranian revolution, in many cases, diplomatically hostile uh, of uh, the uh, of the uh, different uh, relations because um, Iran is one of the major or major uh, player, major player in the Middle East. Of course, there is also Saudi Arabia, Jordan and the United Emirates United, okay, against Iran with US support and other Arab countries. They continue to have normal relations a lot of countries from the region in relations with Iran. Arab leaders have generally identified Iran as an important 
player in the region. I, I want to say just one thing. When we speak about the Middle East, we are speaking about the Arab countries, but there is an, uh, an exception, which is Iran. Of course, uh, it's an Islamic country, but it's not an Arab country. That's why uh, the uh, League of Arab States and others uh, organizations are largely, are largely modeled on the organization and functioning of the, of the United States. From my point of view, the brief overview that there are viable, very important structures in the MENA area, are the, are they, this area uh, is engaged in finding solutions to the problems faced by, uh, by uh, the states in the region. The most important thing from my point of view is that these structures have capacity to make use of the problems in the, in the region faced by the states in the area without, however, and I think this will be the most important uh, 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 exit, is the capacity to make use of the problems faced by the states from the region in this area, without, of course, sometimes, however, excluding bilateral relations from other states outside the area. The priority, in my view, is to use, first of all, the regional structures such uh, as a priority given, uh, the extremely important, of course, the MENA regions in today's world. We have to recognize that in the geopolitical system today, without the existing and the functioning of the Middle East, a lot of countries could not continue to develop their economy. That's why you, you have a very important asset, but you should try to find solutions for the countries in the, in the region. And also, of course, if they have some, uh, some bilateral agreements with other countries out of the region, but nevertheless, I repeat, the top priority should be to use really the most important local and regional organizations. We tried during our presidency uh, of the European Union in 2019, one of our main uh, instruments, one of our proposals was the first, the organizing of the first summit, European Union uh, Arab countries, it, and also with the League of Arab States. We also involved in the process of negotiations for adopting the conclusions of the European Union Council in 2019 and offering an important step forward in the Middle East uh, uh, countries. This is practically what I wanted to say. It's an honor and a pleasure to discuss about this issue. And I want to conclude saying in a very short uh, terms, you have to work very seriously together in the region to cooperate and develop one of the, I repeat, key issues of the, uh, of, of the world and the development of the economy in, in, uh, in, in the world as, a, as such. Thank you very much. Uh, I hope uh, I was not too long. And I'm very honored to continue to listen to the other colleagues. And maybe from my point of view, uh, the most important um, speaker will be Adrian Severin if he has the, the role of it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. So I'm uh, jobless because uh, you already introduced uh, the personality of uh, Dr. Adrian Severin, former uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs and a lot of other responsibilities. So, dear Adrian, you have the floor. Well, thank you very much. Happy to be together with you today. Uh, uh, certainly, my friend uh, Theodor Meleshkanu joked uh, when uh, introducing me uh, in such a flattering way, as well as Livio Mureshan. But, uh, you know, you have to excuse that uh, because uh, uh, of their friendship and uh, the way in which they want to express it today. 
Uh, well, uh, I, uh, since we have uh, in presence uh, so many people coming from the Middle East, so many people who are really knowledgeable about uh, the um, phenomena and uh, the developments over there, I would uh, try to put this topic, our today's topic, within a broader perspective, let's say a global perspective, following to a certain extent what our previous speaker, Mr. Fassleben and uh, Melesh Kano already did. Uh, well, uh, from that in, in point of view, and in this respect, I would uh, like to draw uh, the attention on three uh, major processes which uh, um, are, have a global relevance and which exercise a major influence, according to my opinion, on MENA states. Number one, the emergence of the Asian century, the century of Asia, with China as a new global superpower. Number two, the global, I would call it neo-Marxist revolution, based on the collectivization of the cultural identities started from and by the United States in an attempt to content and deter China and to preserve the Pax Americana as a global order. And number three, the race of the Turkish, uh, let's say, federalism or the Turkish neo-Ottomanism, one, as one call it, on uh, and the federalization of the former Oriental empires. I have in mind Russia, Turkey, and Iran. Obviously, they were uh, former empires, and they have some kind of a memory of this historic past. In response, this their federalization in response to the so-called progressist globalism of America and some of its allies, who through the before mentioned global revolution, uh, which one might call very well cultural global revolution, are looking for a so-called new normality achieved by or through a global reset. So I think that these are the three main um, factors or the main uh, realities or the main developments in the today's uh, world. There are many other uh, important events, but to my mind, we have to look on these three first and foremost. Now to uh, go a, a little bit along these lines, I would uh, start with uh, calling China. And uh, I would just like to say that China is a different superpower as compared to the previous superpowers. The previous superpowers were a basically European and transatlantic superpowers uh, along the centuries. The last one, of course, United States in the American century. But China is different, basically different. It is a multi, by its tradition, it's a multilateralist superpower a non-expansionist superpower and a power in love of uh, harmony and uh, equilibrium in the internal and international relations. The containment and deterrence policies, which were so, or to a large extent, very successful in, uh, during the Cold War, in the competition or in the um, conflict, between the communist bloc, Soviet Union, and the capitalist bloc, United States, are not going to work any longer this time. And uh, therefore, I think that one of the main concerns we might have is the fact that many policy planners and many policy makers in the Euro-Atlantic world are willing to come back to deterrence and containment as being the successful policies. They are not going to work in uh, respect of uh, the Asian century and uh, the China race, but that policies might transform China into a nationalistic and militarist superpower by reaction. So we have to be extremely careful that China would not remain the same or would not cherish its old traditions any longer if it is put on a great pressure or a too big pressure and uh, uh, as a result of containment and deterrence uh, strategies. 
at uh, um, on the other hand, uh, the race of uh, the U.S. interest uh, to setting the rivalry with China reduced, and this is obvious, the U.S. interest for the MENA states, for the Middle East. This is obvious to my mind. But uh, this could be an asset for the MENA states. When United States is less interesting in MENA, it would allow, as also Teodor Meleshkanu put it, the states to try to find by themselves a way out from their uh, hardships and for their difficulties. So this should be seen as a asset and not a liability. At the same time and within the same frame, I would also say that there will be an attempt, and Romania, my country, is feeling this attempt, to involve, to be involved in the war between, let's say, the white Anglo-Saxon, like AUKUS uh, arrangement, uh, you know, uh, war against China in order to, let's say, marginalize the assets of the Asian century. I think it would be a big mistake for the MENA state to interfere in that war. Uh, as I think that is for Romania a big mistake to um, interfere in that war. I think on the contrary, I think that the MENA countries should join China uh, and try to find ways and agreements to work together uh, rather than embarking in a Euro-Atlantic war against China. Third point, confronted now the revolution, the global revolution, few remarks. Confronted with the century of Asia, as I said, and the new order announced by it, United States and its European allies have, to my mind, two major options. Number one, to give up their Atlantocentric, Atlantic-centric claims for shaping the world order and to join China in an effort to define a post-American order together. This is, I would think, the best approach. Within this frame, I, I could also think to some kind of a Marshall Plan for uh, the Asian countries, which have, as uh, uh, Werner Fassleben mentioned it very properly, economic difficulties. It would be extremely important, while well, now we can speak about Afghanistan, which was, uh, you know, uh, left uh, to his fate, to its fate to a certain extent, as in the past some other countries, also Afghanistan, by the way, was left to its fate. After the war with Soviet Union, uh, they were supported by the United States, but afterwards they were left without any support in order to overcome their economic and social hardships. I think that, uh, well, I put the Marshall Plan simply because it sounds nicely for us, for the Europeans. But anyhow, uh, I believe that now an economic stimulus, an economic support for countries in, uh, in, in economic uh, uh, difficulty, uh, it's absolutely important. And certainly I have in mind also Iran with uh, the sanctions. And uh, I think that uh, the sanctions should be eliminated, and I agree, without any prerequisite conditions, because the sanctions are a part of the problem and not a part of the solution. The sanctions never worked, and let me put it also like that. Economic sanction, deterrence, containment, uh, they are all confront military confrontations. They prove to be unsuccessful, at least nowadays. We have a chain of won wars followed by lost pieces and followed by regional anarchy, by regional turmoil. If we repeat this uh, recipe again and again, we cannot obtain a different result. This is the only result we could obtain from that kind of policy. And this is the second uh, possible approach, which in my mind is undesirable. And this is to build a global coalition against China, a global coalition against Iran, mainly based on the Anglo-Saxon white nations, as I said, and to start a world revolution and a new Cold War. They have, unfortunately, for the time being, the American administration have chosen the second, the second uh, way, and this is by 
um, and this means the ideologization and militarization of the international relations. And they do that exactly as the Soviet Union did it during the Cold War. Now I'm afraid that we can speak about Sovietization of the United States. And this is very distressing for countries like mine who had fought against the Soviet Union. And now we have to resist against this, uh, you know, no Marxist wave, which are coming from the West and not any longer from, from, uh, from the East. And I, uh, this ideologization uh, of the international relations uh, is obvious. And I would pick up just one example. In a couple of days from now, uh, it will take place a worldwide summit on democracy, which was convened by the president of the United States. And this proves very well how democracy is not any longer our target, but it is a weapon, uh, an ideological weapon in order to fight a new Cold War. The topics of this uh, summit are democracy, uh, which was presented as a, a way to fight the authoritarianism. So democracy against authoritarianism. The countries invited are the good countries. Uh, they are the democratic countries. The, the, the rest of the world are the authoritarian countries, the bad countries. Like in the Cold War, the goods and the bad, the angels and the devils. And the definition of uh, one and the other is based on ideology. Now, second uh, topic uh, would be corruption. Wow. So corruption is not any longer, uh, the fight against corruption is not any longer a target, but an ideological means in order to fight a political war. And uh, uh, lastly, the human rights. Okay, so the whole way uh, to put, and mainly the, the mentioning of corruption uh, on, the top, uh, on the agenda, it's a clear uh, sign that we are, um, we, are, we are dealing with an ideological war which, would, which just would prepare for the war uh, in a broader uh, sense. Now, uh, Poland and Hungary are not invited. Very interesting. But Saudi Arabia is not invited. Okay, I'm, my, my guess is that Saudi Arabia is, was not invited, not because the United States, who are the allies of the Soviet, were the allies of the Saudi Arabia, uh, all of a sudden noticed the uh, democratic deficit in Saudi Arabia. This proves, the non-invitation of Saudi Arabia proves that the United States are not any longer interested in the region as they used to be before. And namely, Saudi Arabia is not so interesting for the, relevant for the United States in its war with China. So whatever we might think about Saudi Arabia, in, when it is left aside because uh, this is not relevant in the view of a war, this is uh, something which could not remain unnoticed and which uh, should, uh, should concern us. Number uh, three uh, or four, uh, Turkey, Iran, and Russia. Uh, and at the end of the World War II, the emerging superpower, which was uh, United States, joined the former European superpowers, UK, France, Germany, in order to balance another emerging superpower, namely the Soviet Union. Uh, today, the formal Oriental empires joining or are supposed to join the emerging superpower, China, in order to neutralize the ideologization and militarization of the international relations by the United States and its allies. To this end, uh, they should anyhow overpass the old rivalries and controversies, historic rivalries, which had their, to a certain extent, objective roots. And this is not going to be easy. Uh, within the context, uh, I would uh, uh, just mention without any elaboration, because the time is short, uh, four uh, Turkish policies, which are of an utmost interest to my mind. Number one, the establishment of the Turkish states organization and uh, the institutionalization of the cultural, economic, and consequently political relations be between the states which are speaking a Turkish uh, language. This is extremely important. 
and certainly a certain permissive attitude uh, of Russia in this respect, or let's say, I would say soft, not friendly attitude, shows that Russia understands that it is important for Turkey to uh, regain some power and to stay off the um, Western alliances to which it used to belong. Number two, the Black Sea policy of Turkey. This is very tricky and this involves the Ukrainian issue. And since uh, you know the war is knocking at the doors here, I would be extremely interesting to follow, interested to follow uh, the Turkish position in event in, in, in case of a um, open conflict between Russia, Ukraine, and uh, some others in, uh, in, uh, in Europe. This might indeed put in jeopardy uh, the Russian-Turkish relations. The Blue Motherland perspective. So the Turkish presence in, in, the, in the Black Sea, in the, sorry, not in the Black Sea, in the Mediterranean Sea is also to be followed. And I think that to a certain extent, the Russian uh, stepped back uh, steps back in uh, in uh, in Mediterranean in Libya, as uh, uh, it was mentioned by Werner Fassleben, I believe. Uh, it speaks about the fact that Russia wants to be more, uh, uh, let's say, careful when challenging uh, some of the Turkish policies. And number four, uh, the involvement uh, of Turkey in the geopolitical space, emptied by the withdrawal of the. Uh, of the of the United States in Afghanistan in Syria, uh, where indeed there might be um, some different uh, in in uh, in uh, interest for, between uh, between these countries. Anyhow, uh, uh, sorry. Well, um, anyhow, uh, these uh, are points of concern which should be followed, and I will end um, with. Uh, my mentioning once more the economic issue. Uh, and I think indeed I share the view that Turkey and Iran uh, had economic problems which might uh, um, stop them in uh, playing the role they might play. Therefore, I think that for the sake of peace and stability, we have to help them to overcome these economic uh, problems as it was mentioned before, I believe. And uh, indeed, I think that we cannot ignore the Abrahamic Accords, uh, which um, are, are opening a completely new era uh, and uh, are um, shaping a completely new strategic uh, environment in, in, the, in the Middle East. And, but I think that this, uh, this, uh, this development is uh, mostly favorable, not only for Israel, but it's favorable for the whole uh, area. So uh, I would stop uh, here and uh, thank you very much for your questions. A great power competition towards Syrian crisis. Thank you so much. Uh, 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 great power. I don't know who is speaking. Sorry. So uh, thank you very much for your presentation and uh, very interesting and uh, challenging ideas you presented here. Uh, we have some minutes till the end of our session, and Ambassador Tsar has expressed his uh, uh, wish to say some, some words. Please use uh, the th three minutes, and then we, had, uh, we received several questions and, uh, and uh, Q&A from, from participants and phone calls. So please uh, uh, be very short, Ambassador Tsar. You have the floor. Uh, good morning. Do you hear me? Yes, yes, it's good. As a senior expert of IPIS uh, concentrate on the Eastern and Central Europe, I would like again uh, express my uh, thanks to Mr. Flavius and uh, uh, their friend who cooperated very close to us to have uh, and to organize such as conference as we hear from the beginning, uh, we hear very important uh, speech and point of view from Iranian side and actually from Romanian side. I am very glad and uh, I think uh, this conference would uh, play important uh, role, uh, mainly in enhancing 
relation and cooperation between Romania and Iran, because this is, I think, very important. We have more capacity and the reality of our relation is apart from the capacity. Thank you again. And I uh, again express my uh, thanks and glad to hear, especially our old friend, uh, Mr. Meleshkano, Excellency Meleshkano and uh, Severin. And I always, I appreciate when I was in mission, our close cooperation with uh, Romanian authority. Thank you again. Thank you, uh, Ambassador Tsar. We have uh, uh, other three minutes, and I uh, I um, have to stress that somebody, uh, Mr. Kreishor, have uh, mentioned that maybe we have not to forget that uh, uh, what we are experiencing now, the tensions, but also this kind of interferences uh, in the region are coming also from the former colonial uh, powers and the colonial uh, uh, games. Uh, we have to accept this is an invitation for a special uh, special conference. But uh, who wants to take the floor in one, two minutes to, to, to tackle this uh, quite uh, delicate uh, issue? So, uh, one of the speakers, uh, uh, Minister Mereshkano, or uh, Minister Severin, who want to... Uh, yeah. Well, if I may, I would address this. It's obvious, uh, and I did. I, I will do it because it is very much in line which, uh, with uh, what I have already said. Uh, indeed, what we see today, uh, we see uh, mm, uh, a coalition of the former uh, Euro-Atlantic empires, one was uh, anti-colonial empire, it, and this is uh, United States, obviously, uh, and uh, the former uh, European colonial uh, empires uh, who are trying to preserve an Euro-Atlantic uh, order, an order which perhaps in the past uh, it was all right, but now it reached its historic uh, limits. Certainly, we can speak a lot about colonization, what was good, what was bad. We can speak a lot of decolonization, which to my mind, uh, basically it was good, but the way in which uh, has been done, it's disputable. Uh, and it, uh, the heritage is terrible. So uh, now I think with a century of Asia, there is a theoretical at least chance to overcome this, uh, this, uh, this bad heritage of colonialism. Uh, unfortunately, not everybody understand that. And instead of uh, joining the process, the historic process and finding um, common solutions and, common and put, um, moving ahead with common strategies, some wants to stick with the past. So this is uh, something which you know from history and this would only make the transitions toward the future uh, more painful. But uh, this transition, to my mind, could not be stopped. The only thing is, uh, as John Mendel Keynes put it, even if on long run everything would be fine, on long run we all will be dead. So uh, even young people like me could uh, expect for many years from now, and Mr. Fazlebend as well, we are young, we can uh, be patient. But nevertheless, uh, I would hope that we will have good solution on a short run rather than on a long run. So. That's my only remarks on that. Thank you that so much. And uh, 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 we, have to, uh, we have to go ahead, but not before to remember what uh, was uh, said by uh, former president, but by former president uh, uh, Trump uh, uh, at the end of his mandate that uh, the United States have uh, wasted about eight trillions in three decades in the Middle East without the gas. And uh, he was uh, not an exit strategy. The good news is that the uh, new administration from Washington is willing to continue the dialogue with Iran, trying to find out solutions and uh, uh, playing uh, uh, a more moderate uh, uh, role 
discussions and interventions uh, which will follow. So I want to thank so much uh, to the keynote speakers. We had uh, here now uh, Minister uh, Islami, uh, Minister Faslam, uh, Minister Melishkanu, Minister Severin, and also Ambassador Sar. And uh, uh, let's go forward because as uh, uh, Minister Severin mentioned, uh, we have a lot of things to do in the next 20, 30 years in the region. We have to work together very hard for, for, 